which was read into the court record by a witness for the plaintiff. And I'm actually going to paraphrase this, so this is not his actual words, but you will get some of his actual words. Okay. And the story starts like this. In 1748, a little boy named Philip arrived in Somerset County, New Jersey, wrapped in a blanket. Now, he was passed in the hands of James Van Horn, who was an elite slaveholder in the region, into those of Van Horn's housekeeper, a woman named Margaret Weiser, who resided at the Rocky Hill Plantation year-round. Now, Weiser was tasked with finding a wet nurse for the infant. Now, Weiser decided on Jane Furman, who was a local woman of Welsh descent. Elite infants were sometimes suckled by such wet nurses, a practice that was hotly debated by the middle of the 18th century, with a discourse that linked the wrong wet nurse with conveying disagreeable qualities, qualities that your child should not have if you're elite. Jane was at home with her niece, Abigail, when Weiser arrived with the baby, an event notable enough that Abigail relayed the detail of her encounter with her husband, a man named Gabriel. After asking Jane if she would be good enough to suckle the child, Weiser pulled back the blanket that covered the child and found that he was black. While the black woman, enslaved black woman, might serve as a wet nurse to her white mistress's children, especially within the elite Dutch slaveholding networks in New York and New Jersey, the opposite was extremely rare, although it did happen. This is not the only case. It happened across the Atlantic world. But again, this is not the norm. Now, Weiser, as you can see in the testimony, which looks like this, stressed the pedigree of Philip's mother and that, perhaps as proof, she would visit her newborn child shortly. Now, despite Weiser's case, Jane still required some more persuasion before she finally consented to serve as a wet nurse for this child. Now, this was an agreement made in private by women and between women, but this moment was transformed, and the meaning of this moment reflects the values of the early republic and the burgeoning new country. So, over three decades later, Philip constructed both his maternal descent, elite background, as well as the detail of his white wet nurse in a bid to win his freedom. Now, Gabriel Furman, Jane's nephew, testified that later, James Van Horn actually did come back to talk to Jane. So, James Van Horn came back with his wife and added the detail that the child's grandparents were some of the greatest people in New York. Now, this detail maybe was his oblique way of saying that the child was a close family member or the child of a friend. Further, the little boy's name matched that of Philip Van Horn, James' brother, and Philip, there's been another recent scholarship has looked at the names that show up in slave for sale advertisements and in runaway slave advertisements, and the name Philip is a very unusual name given to an enslaved person at this time. The Van Horns had, along with other elite New York and New Jersey families, begun to found institutions of higher learning, and so the fact that he included a detail that the boy should be educated genteelly also is a nod to perhaps there was a familial relation that was pretty close. Now, how do we know about this? The narrative, as it comes to us, is part of a highly choreographed moment in a courtroom. This is supposed to relay certain cultural understandings in order to sway the court to Philip's favor, and he would need all the help he could get because he was coming up against the claim of two men who were very elite indeed in the neighborhood. One of them was John Van Horn, James' son, who we don't know, might well have been Philip's uncle, and the other was a man named Colonel Dirk Tenbroek. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the players so you understand the stakes. Dirk Tenbroek had fought on the American side of the Revolutionary War, and he lost a number of slaves who actually ran away and served the British military during the war and then were successfully evacuated from New York with the British to Nova Scotia. Now what happened to them when they got to Nova Scotia is kind of up in the air, 
And this is a moment where, uh, where black people are being re-enslaved in places um, like Nova Scotia and in New York. So Philip is also finding himself in this dragnet. Not only was uh, Ten Brook a member of the colonial elite, but kinship connected him to other members of the elite who sat on the court, including Philip Livingston, who was a signer of the Constitution, and who had married his daughter, Christina. Unmoved by the language of liberty, these two men devoted considerable time and financial resources to hindering the freedom of people they counted as their property. Now, John Van Horn was a large landowner and elite, and again, might have been connected by family, close family ties to Philip. He grew up in a county with a considerable number of slaves whose economy was devoted to slavery. In the latter decades of the 17th century, East New Jersey had, like Carolina, been settled by a number of Barbadian transplants, and uh, this kind of commitment to plantation slavery had only strengthened during the 18th century. The Van Horn family profited from both the slave trade and from the bondage of people of African descent and also native um, descent. His grandfather, Cornelius Van Horn, had served on the council that hindered legislation that would place duties on the imports of enslaved people. New York was a duty-free zone when it came to importing enslaved people, and so a lot of the slave ships that were destined for New York would roll into Perth Amboy, um, take, uh, get the, 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 the cargo of, of captive people, and then they would be traded into New York in order to flout those laws. One year after Philip's birth, John's brothers, David and Samuel Van Horn, were co-owners of the slave ship Revenge, along with their cousins, William and Gerard Beekman, and two other New York merchants. The ship left New York for the Sierra Leone estuary, and then set sail for Jamaica, unloading 150 of its original 172 captive people, as well as taking on additional enslaved people. It then disembarked for New York, its final port of call, where 45 enslaved human beings were sold. Now John's pursuit of Philip and other enslaved people underscores how zealous he was to retain mastery. Here is a man who is very much committed to his place, not only as a member of the elite, but also as a slaveholder. Two years after Philip's case, John tried another case against a black man named Prime, who claimed freedom. Now this claim, of course, was disputed again by John Van Horn. And the court ordered that Prime had who, uh, um, be arrested by the sheriff of Hunterton and be delivered to the court. Now Prime was fortunate. The state legislature overturned the ruling by an act dated 21st of November, 1783, owing to Prime's service during the American Revolution. Now, the last person we're gonna be talking about is Gabriel, uh, the witness that Philip was able to bring to give, uh, to give the court an idea of his background. Now, Gabriel, Philip's witness, lived in Somerset County for years and had some standing in the community, but he was by no means an elite member of the community. And so one wonders, did Furman feel any discomfort discussing such an intimate conversation over a delicate and politically charged issue in open defiance of the two elite and powerful men who claimed Philip's body. After all, it was his aunt who had been used as a wet nurse, and although his wife was privy to the details, he only knew about them secondhand. So he's giving a story that he's heard from his wife, um, relayed by her aunt. Yet, according to his testimony, he had had plenty of time to interact with Philip, who grew up and remained in the neighborhood after spending five years with Jane. So Philip actually lived in their family for five years. The Furman family were near neighbors of the Van Horns and served other community functions, though they were, again, by no means elite. In July 2nd, on July 2nd, 1734, both Gabriel Furman and his wife Abigail acted as a witness for the will of Ethan Field, who lived in Newton, New Jersey. So you can see that they are active members of the community, but again, um, they're not showing up in the councils uh, and minutes of the community. Now the neighborhood where Gabriel and Philip lived roiled with racial tension. Court cases within the Rocky Hill community reflected the violence <coughs> and tension of slavery. Um, you see people being whipped, you see people being branded, people being brought, um, dragged off ships, brought back into slavery. Perhaps Furman felt a certain degree of pleasure at making the lives of the elite men whose family connections dated back to New Netherland roots. 
The Furmans had arrived in the area by way of Massachusetts, but a large number of the elite in Jersey counties, such as Somerset and Bergen, were overwhelmingly Dutch. In contrast, the Furmans were of Welsh descent. They might very well have had political, uh, differing political ideals uh, in a state that was recently recovering from the trauma of the American Revolution. Such political divisions were not perfunctory. But whether motivated by neighborly or even an adopted familial concern for Philip, political or ethnic tensions, Gabriel was witnessing again two powerful slaveholders whose social positions were only strengthened with a break from Great Britain. Now, Philip's case is one of several freedom cases brought uh, before the state of New Jersey following the end of the Revolutionary War. The fact that Philip was able to produ produce witnesses in his favor points to several important details about the Rocky Hill community where he spent his life. Now, these details include the importance of female networks and the cultural construction of white motherhood, as well as the en endurance of community memory for kinship ties, even in the case of African descended people. So he knew for years that he, was, that he was going to be free at a certain time in his life, and he kept up these connections. He, in, a sense, in essence, networked his whole life in order to ensure that he would be able to make good on the freedom that he had been promised as a young child. All right, and I, I wanted to include this image uh, to, to kind of underscore this, this second section where we talk about him being surrounded by the community. And, it, and this is actually an, an, image, an image of an infant who's been living with a wet nurse um, being taken away from his foster parents uh, by his natural mother. Um, and it's from um, the collection that's uh, edited by Etienne Aubry. Uh, and it is also um, a late 18th century image. So I thought this would be kind of a good way of showing this moment of neighborly, um, 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 moment of neighborly and also female networked um, central uh, moment. So Gabriel's testimony began by explaining the seasonal living habits of the Van Horns, stating that, quote, Part of the winter season, Mr. Van Horn frequently resided in New York, and in the summer season, came up to his plantation at Rocky Hill in Somerset County. Now, although James took great pains to conceal the child, he was also following a trend that had become popular among the urban elite uh, of sending their children out to a wet nurse in the country. This is something that people were doing all across the Atlantic world. Uh, they was, it was seen as a more healthful environment for a child. Boston jurist Samuel Sewell's daughter sent her, children to, sent her children to the countryside to nurse, as did Philadelphia Quaker Elizabeth Drinker, sandwich drinker. Drinker, who kept a diary for the majority of her life, recorded that she had a close relationship with her wet nurse and uh, that her children remained with the wet nurse exclusively until they were weaned. This is a time between one year and 18. Philip's mother, whose name remains a mystery, did visit 18 months later, likely as Wiser was weaning Philip. Walking, and perhaps even possessed of a few words, young Philip would have changed dramatically. Nursed and cared for by Jane, those words would have been English, maybe a bit of Welsh, not the Dutch words and idioms his mother would have no doubt heard as a child in the primarily Dutch elite community of Rocky Hill and the Van Horn's wider family networks. Nonetheless, Philip's later appeal would rest on his maternal blood tie to that elite Dutch community. Jane was not the only choice of wet nurse that the family had at their disposal. James Van Horn asked for James' respo James respos response, explaining explicitly that he had other people that he could tap if she was feeling too uncomfortable to nurse uh, this child. His close involvement underscores two important things. First, as scholars have noted, the decision to send children out to a wet nurse rested with the patriarch, whether husband, father, or brother, and not solely with the mother, or even at all <laughs> with the mother. James bundled the child up and made the necessary arrangements with his housekeeper. He was not anomalous in this behavior. He also made clear the type of environment that he wished for Philip. Breastfeeding was not a private event, which is the second kind of part you can see with this. Breastfeeding was not a private event done within a select group of female relatives and friends, but it was more of a communal public affair. So um, there's these two kind of pillars of things we can understand from this. The first, 
that um, men were highly involved in determining whether women went or whether children went out to 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 a wet nurse, and second, that um, breastfeeding was not a private event done within a group of female relatives and friends. A Philadelphia grandfather named Dr. Richard Hill took an active role in advising that his grandsons be sent to a wet nurse. Virginia slaveholder Langdon Carter wrote a withering judgment against his daughter-in-law, who he believed was breastfeeding his grandson in order to prevent pregnancy. And he actually went into detail saying, you know, she's sick and she's still breastfeeding the child. She's going to damage his constitution. This woman is just doing it for selfish reasons. Now, some of Carter's dismay about his daughter daughter-in-law lay rooted in early modern notions of the body. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the history of early modern notions of the body. And I, and I wanted to start with this image of nature uh, that appeared on, in, on, um, uh, uh, in a book that included uh, de Bry engravings. Um, now, the first thing is that breast milk, according to the humoral theory of medicine, was viewed as transformed menstrual blood. So monthly menses were seen as ridding the body of bad humors, but during pregnancy, it nourished the developing baby. Now the best of that was reabsorbed by the body and used as breast milk, but the worst of it was expelled by the body as afterbirth. As such a vital part of the woman's body, it could impart both good and bad qualities. Early modern writers in both religious and non-religious tomes warned of the dangers of wet nurses who could transmit bad characteristics to the infants in their care. In 1710, Cotton Mather wrote that women who did not attempt to breastfeed were, quote, dead while they live and shirking their divine calling, although he did allow for wet nurses in the cases of women who tried but could not nurse their children. While nursing manuals generally counsel that families in need of wet nurses should search for healthy women with a great supply of milk, it included other items, such as cleanliness and sobriety. Potential wet nurses, man, uh, potential wet nurses, manuals urge, should have certain physical characteristics, such as a ruddy complexion with medium brown hair. You don't want any redheads in there, because you know what that's going to do to your children. <laughs> <laughs> physical characteristics, um, uh, such as a breast that brings forth milk at the slightest manipulation. So the idea that breast milk could transmit racial characteristics was present as well. This isn't a very large leap. Right? In 1750, Eliza Lucas Pickney wrote that after explaining uh, that her daughter had been breastfed by an enslaved wet nurse, the Princess of Wales, quote, stroked Harriet's cheek, said it made no alteration in the complexion, and paid her the compliment of being very fair and pretty. Sojourner Truth remembered that her mother served as a wet nurse to her Hudson Valley Dutch ma masters, the, Har um, the Hardison family. Although the frequency of the use of slave wet nurses remains debated, elite, wet women, uh, elite white women did associate black slaves with uncleanliness. So even though they're using black wet nurses, there's kind of this, this um, pull against this. In 1720, Dutch mistress Alita Livingston wrote, I'm having trouble enough here with our people. Tom doesn't want to do anything and doesn't want to and what doesn't want to be anything and is fat and greasy. Kathleen Brown included the example of a white child's love for his enslaved nurse Daphne, a familiarity that his grandmother, Elizabeth Cock Holloway, regarded with disgust, writing, He kisses her and runs his head head on her neck, for which he is never the sweeter nor cleaner, but you know children. They thrive best in the dirt. So I also wanted to talk about kind of the constructions of breasts, how they look, and how that is also connected to um, changing notions of, bre uh, of breast milk's efficacy in relation to the body. So sagging breasts, as you can see uh, behind me, are, were associated with witches and the devil, a deformity that would pass on disagreeable traits. Now the images displayed here are of 16th century Dutch engraver named Zacharias Delendo and represent poverty and envy in relation to a vision of withered motherhood. In envy, as you can see, the devil is depicted with sagging breasts um, and possesses elements of the Medusa legends. There's a, kind of a, um, uh, a gender bending 
the um, association with this image. Uh, and poverty is represented as, a suck, as suckling a child, but both children appear malnourished um, and, and, and sickly. Uh, contrast that to the previous image of nature that I put up uh, with fecund, spherical breasts that are dripping with milk. When classifying humans' places in nature, uh, um, um, the, the Swedish um, naturalist Linnaeus chose breasts to define mammalia. He could have chosen anything, right? Um, he could have chosen hair, um, but he didn't. He chose breasts, uh, which one historian notes, uh, um, Munda Schiebinger, uh, is a break with the Aristotelian tradition, which viewed women as misbegotten males, a monster or error of nature. During the middle of the 18th century, maternal breasts also started to become eroticized in literature, a shift that parallels fashion changes which emphasize décolletage and uh, the shape of the breast and the nipple. It also became indicative of racial difference. As historian Jennifer Morgan highlights, 17th century English writers like Richard Ligon in his true and exact history of the island of Barbados reinforced African women's inferiorities. She writes the following, that he quote, paired descriptions of animality with descriptions of breasts hanging down below their navels. He tethered his narrative to familiar images of black women that effectively naturalized the enslavement of Africans. Like his predecessors, Ligon offered proof of Africans' capacity for manual labor. Just realize that this is the picture that goes with that. <laughs> um, their aptitude for slavery through ease of childbearing. In a fortnight, Ligon writes, after giving birth, this woman is at work with her pickaninny at her back, as merry a soul as any there is. Likewise, in Peter de Mars, a description of the, an historical declaration of the Golden Kingdom of Guinea, written in Dutch, in 1602 and reproduced throughout the 17th and 18th century, he remarks, quote, when the child is born, the mother goes to the water to wash and may clean herself, not once dreaming of a month lying in, as women here with us used to do. They use no nurses to help them when they lie in childbed, neither seek to lie dainty or soft. This shows that the women here are of a cruder nature and stronger posture than the females in our land in Europe. Now, Morgan argues that this was a justification for the explo exploitation of African women as laborers and also perma permanently placed them outside of the community of female Christians whose membership was ensured by their inheritance of Eve's pain in childbirth. Now with the rise of the scientific revolution, good mothering was increasingly divorced from the physical realities of motherhood. Thus, despite the taxing nature of breastfeeding on the bodies of many 18th century women who were not able to get adequate nutrition in order to keep up their supply of milk and had other problems trying to express milk and, and they were plagued by infections like mastitis uh, that could actually make the breast necrotic and actually cause the death of the mother. Advice manuals lauded the otherworldly quality of breastfeeding, represented it as a universally moral and uplifting experience. The medical efficacy of breast milk gained traction in the scientific community at the same time that male midwives were entering the birthing room, a space that had been uniformly female. Elite women were characterized by one elite, one English physician as, quote, half mothers who wantonly abandoned their children as soon as they were born to frequent parties. The widespread success of English novelist Samuel Richardson's Pamela, first published in 1740, as well as French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau's, uh, I don't know why I'm having to em Emile, <laughs> popular rights division of motherhood is central to the functioning of virtuous Republican society. Rousseau wrote, when mothers deign to nurse their own children, then will be a reform in morals. Natural feeling will revive in every heart, there will be no lack of citizens for the state. With the closing decades of the 18th century, debates about the place of motherhood and women in the new American Republic were infused with notions of what is proper conduct for a woman, proper conduct for a mother in the Republic. In March of 1791, a piece entitled Our Grandmothers, penned by the recently deceased, he wasn't deceased when he wrote it, but when it was published, he had recently died. 
Governor of uh, New Jersey, William Livingston, reimagined the life <coughs> past of, of a woman whose own habitation was their delight. And the rearing of offspring, their greatest pleasure. These women enjoyed happiness in their chimney corners, while their deluded granddaughters seek for it in vain amidst the tumult of the world. Now, colonial men, in his conception, inclined to marry, dared not choose such a mate because such a woman was likely to perpetuate a race of diligent and attentive women. That this rapturous vision was at odds with the action of William Livingston's actual grandmother, Alita Schuyler Livingston, who had managed the running of Manor Livingston while his grandfather was frequently away, was immaterial. Livingston was articulating a vision of motherhood that praised childbearing and the perpetuation of race of like-minded women content to stay in their chimney corners. Now, English physician Charles White bluntly located racial difference as well as sexual desire in the maternal breasts of European women, writing, in what quarter of the globe shall we find the blush that overspreads the soft features of the beautiful women of Europe, that emblem of modesty, of delicate features, and of sense? Where, except on the bosom of European women, two such plump and snowy white hemispheres tip with vermilion? So you see this, um, <laughs> this wedding of the, the notions of motherhood with race, and also the sexuality of the maternal breast. Um, now, at the same time that you're seeing all of this happening in, in, in with cultural production and the debates uh, within the scientific and, so, and, and, cult, and, and, and elite communities, you are also seeing a proliferation of advertisements uh, throughout the colonial uh, newspaper, um, um, throughout the, 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 the uh, colonial newspaper. Now, advertisements for wet nurses appear in colonial newspapers with uh, frequency. At the beginning of the 18th century, these advertisements contain few details and are directed to those in interested to acquire to the printer for more details. So basically, it's a wet nurse is, in, uh, is available. If you're interested, come to the printer if you'd like some more details. As the century progressed, they were posted by women who specifically advertised having good breasts of milk, milk that was not too old and their desire to be placed in a respectable family. So these women are actively um, selling themselves and selling their wares uh, in the newspapers. The 150 advertisements placed in the newspapers uh, that were local to Phillips, so I looked at the newspapers in the New York, now I guess the New York metro area, between the 1740s and until the 1780s reflect this pattern. This has caused at least one historian to assert that breast milk was the most popularly sold commodity in, co in colonial newspapers. <laughs> but alongside advertisements for wet nurses, these colonial newspapers, as you can see here, ran advertisements for the sale of human beings, as well as for the arrest and capture of runaways. This dual proliferation aided in a shift towards wet nurses, increasingly becoming associated with labor production, just as black people and enslaved people more generally were also being associated with group labor. So I wanted to talk about this link between breastfeeding and sexuality and, and, and the implications for Phillips' case, uh, being a, 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 um, a child of mixed racial descent. Now, Philip's freedom case rested on his mother's whiteness because freedom itself became intrinsically li linked to gender in the colonial context with the passage of Parkes' Secretary of Benjamin. And I'll be talking about this more uh, in detail, but I wanted to kind of get that up there. And what this means is that slavery followed the condition of the womb. Right? If your mother was a slave, then that meant you were a slave, and you would then pass on this condition into the next. Now, Philip was no, by no means the only child of mixed racial heritage with links to the elite in New York and New Jersey, but his position within the community was likely met with some unease. The Furmans clearly understood that they were being tasked with safeguarding a certain degree of Philip's elite family identity. That whiteness, or at least eliteness, um, and by extension blackness then, would not be absolute in a certain sense. But James Van Horn, although leaving the couple with instructions to raise the child with an elite education in keeping with his lineage, did not need to explain that the child's color would make him subject to cultural degradation. 
bundles him up and kind of primed people to be prepared for the reveal. Uh, and he was ready to, to tap other people should he be rejected by his first choice. And of course, Philip would not grow up with his mother and among the rest of his elite household. He would experience such a separation that in his adult years, potentially a relative or a neighbor, uh, would claim him as property in court. His freedom would ultimately hinge on appealing to the blood of an elite Dutch woman who was forced to give him up and invoking whiteness reinforced by James Mill. So I want to come back to how this all happened. How did we get there? And where did Parker's sequitur ventrum come from? Uh, of course, um, this was not the law uh, in England at all. Um, and, and this was an, an, a colonial invention. Uh, and we'll be talking about why. Well, before we say that, I want to talk about the fact that white women became the means, not men, white women became the means by which uh, African descended children could become free. So they basically were the conduit to freedom for many of these children. Although these children could still be held for a period of indenture that usually equaled three decades, which when you're thinking about the average lifespan of people during this time period, especially people, African descended people, that was the majority of their life. Um, some cases, uh, courts around the Atlantic world heard cases from mixed race children of white women claiming freedom by dent of their mother. We have numerous cases in Virginia, cases in Connecticut, Rhode Island of this happening. And um, although you do see other children coming and bringing cases uh, who have free mothers who are black or um, uh, native, uh, this claim of white maternal ancestry is the one that usually resulted in freedom for these children. So what did this mean for these white women? Now these white women were not um, off the hook socially, as we say. Um, they were, their sexual behavior represented a challenge right, to the system uh, to the ruling hierarchy of the colony that was, of course, patriarchal. Women could be fined if they were servants, they could have years added to their indentures, or be publicly flogged, or all of these things could happen to them. Uh, and all of this for flouting the law against interracial sex. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the history of this. Interracial sex, uh, or marriage, uh, was, interracial marriage, was illegal uh, across the English colonies. So such unions were counted as bastardy. In 1638, the Dutch passed a law against miscegenation, which stated, each and everyone must refrain from fighting adulterous intercourse with heathens, blacks, and other persons, mutiny, theft, false swearing, and other immorality. I think it's interesting that the Dutch are um, setting apart um, black people from heathens. Right? So if they were Christian, you still can't have uh, sex with in 1662, the Virginia Burgesses reversed centuries of English common law by ruling that children take the condition of their mothers. This decision came on the successful case of a mixed race Virginia woman named Elizabeth Key. So basically, this woman sued for her freedom based on the fact that her father was a freeborn Englishman, uh, following the precedent of English common law, uh, and they were like, we need to change this. As historian, as historian <laughs> Catherine Harrison argued with the passage of the law, Virginia's legislature gave masters free access to the bodies of their enslaved women, who had no legal standing to prosecute sexual assault, and it allowed such masters to profit from the additions to their slave force that resulted from the assault. So it's really incentivizing it. Um, while many slave statutes were rolled out to colonies across the British, Atlantic, pretty much at the same time. And these are colonies that have completely different work routines. If you look at the, 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 the adoption of laws, the slave laws, they're kind of coming down wholesale. The only one that isn't is Parkes. Um, Virginia's neighboring colony, Maryland, um, did not enact the law until 1715. Although by 1681, it had, quali it had a qualified freedom um, um, uh, for people of mixed racial descent by instituting this 30-year waiting period of indentured servitude for people whose mothers were white. Now, the only colony that did kind of wholesale follow Virginia was New York. New York uh, was the only other English colony that adopted Pardis before the middle of the 18th century, enacting the law in 1706. Two years earlier, in 1704, the New Jersey Council passed the Act for Regulating Negro and Indian and Mulatto Slaves, which included a clause 
it mandated castration for any slave convicted of attempted to quote convicted of attempting to quote radish or have carnal knowledge of any white woman maid or child it also encouraged the departure of manumitted slaves by refusing them or their children the right to pass down or inherit property so this is the earliest of these types of laws now in 1709 the crown vacated new jersey's castration clause arguing that it fell outside of the norm of english law but only because it mandated castration for rape um, the crown did not vacate carolina's law that mandated castration for repeat cases of running away so we didn't have a problem with castration it just had a problem with it not being a precedent in english law for rape New Jersey strengthened its slave law again in response to the 1712 uprising of a biracial coalition of slaves and poor whites in New York and replaced the call for castration with the authorization to, quote, inflict such corporal punishment, in parentheses, not extending to life or limb, that shall seem meet. So what that means, well, that was up to the judgment of whoever you came before. And this was only in cases of assault against free persons, quote, profession Christianity. So a nod to the enduring anti-Semitism that continued from the New Netherlands, so from the Dutch era into the 18th century. They replaced a trial by jury with a summary and in bonk processes before two justices. So basically, they used to have 12 men had to come up and basically have, you had to come and apply your case. And they're like, that's taking too long for enslaved people. So they just basically got two justices, and that was the case uh, from then on. Um, and so, you, it, it's interesting to note that despite laws discouraging such unions of, of uh, interracial unions, uh, interracial sex didn't stop, right? It didn't stop at the beginning of the 18th century. Recalling your travels in the countryside of New York in the final decades of the 18th century, uh, a travel writer Anne McBecker Grint Grant argued that the mixed race people she encountered were most likely the result of the progress of the British Army, linking the presence of mixed race people to the outrages of rapine and war, whether than uh, and ignoring that rape existed within the slave system that she saw around her. Her intended 19th century audience, primed by the wildly popular minstrel and blackface traditions, would have likely linked the black loyalist soldiers with notions with ideas of war rape. Now, McVicker Grant's comments also evidence a certain voyeuristic gaze when describing a mixed race man who was directly related to the elite Shirer family. Now, I used to have to explain who they are, but now because of the popularity of Hamilton, everybody knows who the Shirers are. <laughs> but they were a family that descended from New York <coughs> to the generation. The man named Chalk, according to her account, was the result of a dissolute Shiler son that impregnated, quote, a favorite Negro woman to the great offense and scandal of the family, unquote, who, quote, bore a child to him whose color gave testimony to the relation. She continued, the boy was carefully educated, and when he grew up, a farm was allotted to him, well stocked and fertile, but in the depth of wood and brace, about two miles back from the family seat, a destitute white woman who had somehow wandered from the older colonies was induced to marry him, and all the branches of the family thought it incumbent on them, now and then, to pay a quiet visit to Chalk, for so, for some unknown reason, they always called it. I have been in Chalk's house myself, and a most comfortable abode it was, but I considered him as a mysterious and anomalous being. Now, McVicker's Grant's description of Schuyler's situation reads remarkably similar similarly to the instructions left by John James Van Horn um, that Furman and included in his testimony, Gabriel Furman. She also took pains to other Chalk's wife by asserting that she had somehow wandered in from the older colonies. What did she mean by this statement? Perhaps she hoped that, her, that to, her, to imply to her audience that Chalk's wife was not ethnically British, not part of the Anglo um, elite of the colony. Perhaps um, she was French or Dutch or, Pal or, or German from the Palatine and may have even hailed from Quebec um, and wandered into New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Who knows what this was? <laughs> McVicker castigated Chuck's wife while at the same time setting up the situation that she had been induced to marry Chuck. I don't know if she'd been given 
the money, how they just kind of mm -hmm. done this yeah. um, thing. Now, though, she also um, said that chalk needed to, that, that this woman needed to be induced. She also also displayed a, a certain degree of voyeuristic curiosity directed at chalk, who she assert, as, asserted and assessed as a, mis, a mysterious and anomalous being. This is not an, on the surface um, negative things. Now, why would Philip then, in the in, in the in the light of all this, include the testimony about uh, his his mother's uh, background? Well, we need to consider his mother, who kind of is a ghost in this entire narrative. Now, Philip believed that the details of the story would be enough to sway the court in his favor, and it was. He won his freedom against uh, um, against Tenbrook and uh, against John uh, Van Horn. Yet his mother's sexuality shadowed the testimony, always carefully concealed, her name hidden from the account, like the names of countless others who appear in colonial records. The specter of her sexuality remains. And we don't know the details that occurred between her and Philip's father, but we can make some, um, some leaps, and I hope you will um, allow me to make them. He might have been a free black mariner working the docks near the Van Horn's Pearl Street property. Or he could have been one of the family's domestic slaves, a valet, a messenger, or a footman. We wonder, was he whipped, branded, and sold out of the colony for his part in Philip's birth? He might have just been outright murdered. We don't know. Such questions remain beyond the reach of historical inquiry. During the same moment of Philip's appeal, New Jersey women were filing and arguing claims before a committee um, detailing the rape they suffered at the hands of the Loyalists and Hessian forces. If Philip's father was a slave, he could not give his consent to sex with Philip's mother. Such sexual acts between white women and enslaved black men under slavery were not unprecedented. In 1737, William Carr of New York placed an advertisement against his wife, publicizing the reasons for his desire to get a divorce from her, including that his wife Anne had behaved indecently by being too familiar with the Negro slave. All right, so I want to talk a little bit now about notions of difference, gender and the rise of scientific racism. Now, Philip's nativity centralized not only his mother's heritage, but his white wet nurse. Indeed, Philip could have been fed artificially from no medicine and race. I want to talk a little bit about this. That there was the technology to, there um, existed to pump milk at this time. Uh, there were, were um, um, there were bottles that people could use, uh, and there were other ways of getting breast milk other than the wet nurse. That Jane Furman served as his wet nurse for several years was crucial to understanding how his place in the community was being situated and how race was transmitted. It was not merely important that the child was being fed, but from whose breast came his sustenance. Politically and culturally, the Enlightenment uh, fostered beliefs in a common humanity, the possibility of societal progress, the remaking of oneself, and the importance of one's social and ecological environment, which some people have seen as a four-pronged revolt against the hierarchy of hierarchies of the old world. Nevertheless, many Enlightenment thinkers, like John Locke and David Hume, upheld white supremacy and racial slavery. Racism manifested in Enlightenment thinkers' desire to classify and order the natural world. As Enlightenment <coughs> scientists such as Linnaeus, Comte de Buffon, Johann Friedrich Bubenbach, and others created connections between race and place, they divided the race into different types. And they did this by according skin color, cranial measurement, and hair types to the ways in which they ordered human beings. Blumenbach broke with 17th century notions and did not assert that breast size and shape was racial, but he did link large, large breasts with sexual promiscuity. It made sure to note that all Irish women had large breasts. <laughs> Instead, the pendulous breast became associated with class. New Jersey resident and Princeton president Stanhope Smith asserted that pendulous, sagging breasts was a sign of poverty because of the long duration of time that the poor spent nursing children. So you're seeing this nursing starting to be associated with negative things. Nevertheless, the racial categorization of women's bodies continued in tandem with a subtle shift towards class. Blumenbach, who coined the term Caucasian, liked whiteness, uh, linked whiteness with beauty. He wrote, 
It is very easy for white skin to degenerate into brown, but very much more difficult for darker skin already impregnated with carbon, uh, carbonacet, car, carbonaceous pigment to become white. Now, women had a key role in shaping race. He attributed the thick nose and swollen lips of the Ethiopians as uh, due to the fact that when, while in their infancy, they are generally carried on the backs of their mothers who give them suck over their shoulders while they are pounding the, the millet. And during their hard and heavy task, this smashes the baby's um, face, uh, making their nose broad and less run. There were also reports of black children born to white families at this time. Uh, and these were attributed uh, not to sexual infidelity, but rather to um, maternal thoughts and experiences during pregnancy. So if you were thinking something black in your child. <laughs> <laughs> um, naturalists also claimed that years under the hot sun and tropical climate of Africa had darkened the skin and reconfigured the skull of African race, whereas in the cold northern latitudes of Europe um, molded and sustained the Caucasian race. A universal human nature, therefore, housed not fundamental differences, but rather civilized and primitive. Right? These are the two notions that come out of this moment. Edward Long put forward the notion of polygenicism, or that human beings descended from different origins in his History of Jamaica, published in 1774. Now, Long's, Long's ideas were rooted in the brutal slave regime of Jamaica and an attempt to refute the biblical claim. In 1787, Princeton president again, uh, Smith asserted that the proper society could gradually whiten men. So such ideas were featured in his published treatise, Essay on the Causes of the Variety of Complexions and Figure in the Human Species. But this is not something that everybody agreed with. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, like Long, believed uh, that human beings descended from different origins. And he held a dim view of African intelligence. Now he said that some people could be improved by education. Uh, Jefferson thought Native Americans could improve and become civilized in his notes of the state of Virginia. But he believed that blacks were incapable of mental improvement. And this was actually proof of different, different origins of humankind. Um, and so to return back to Philip, what was, what was James Van Horn doing? Why, and why was he including this nativity story in order to bolster his claim? Um, Weiser's, nor, uh, Weiser's involvement, Jane's milk, all of this constructed Philip's identity in a specific way that would be legible to the court and make him more sympathetic to, uh, to his cause for freedom. Van Cleorne clearly intended that some vestige of Philip's elite pedigree might follow him throughout life. But, and maybe he was purposely putting him with Weiser in order to connect him to the whiteness that could be given by mother's milk. Now, at the dawn of the 19th century, these notions were starting to harden and, and, and of course, be politicized in a way that would either support pro-slavery advocates or um, argue for anti-slavery. Now, Philip's story would have been forgotten had it not been um, for his nativity narrative. Uh, and, and his successful bid for freedom. His subtle knowledge of the performativity of the courtroom and the ways notions of gender and race would be read gives some insight into Philip's own intellectual world. As Antonio Bly has argued, slave literacy was much more widespread than previous, previously believed. And based on details given about his childhood, Philip was likely literate. Growing up in Somerset County, he would have been at the nexus of inflows of information from New York, and Pennsylvania, and may have read, read numerous local newspapers. Perhaps he came across Lemuel Haynes' assertion that blacks had the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Haynes, like Philip, was the son of a white woman who was characterized as being descended from respectable New England families. Perhaps Philip molded his own nativity story using Haynes' writing as a base. Perhaps he was constructing himself based on this intellectual print culture that he was involved in. In later decades, breastfeeding would come to be associated more directly with challenges to slavery. After a public lecture given in Indiana, Orator Sardona Truth was called a, called a man, something that of course continues to this day, by one of the Democratic attendees and called to show the female members of the crowd her breasts 
to prove that she was a woman. Truth told them that her breast had suckled many a white babe to the exclusion of her own offspring, that some of those white babies had grown up to a man's estate, that although they had suckled her colored breasts, they were, in her estimation, far more manly than her persecutors appeared to be, and she quietly asked them, as she disrobed her bosom, if they too wished to suck. <laughs> in vindication of her truthfulness, she told them that she would show her breasts to the whole congregation, that it was not to her shame that she uncovered her breasts before them, but to their shame. As the 19th century progressed, the narrative around wet nurses and breastfeeding would turn on the class, uh, would turn into one of, uh, would, would turn on the uh, notion of the class of the mothers. Dirty mothers, linked with little morals, um, were the ones that were now being imagined as serving as wet nurses in the urbanized North. So these women coming in, um, from immigrant women with dirty kind of notions, were these wet nurses. While enslaved mothers, also associated with dirt and cleanliness, uh, in the antithesis of cleanliness, were nurses in the southern states. All right, so in conclusion, uh, I wanted to talk about um, what happened to breastfeeding and wet nursing in, in the interim period. And this is gonna be a, a, a huge kind of overview. In the 20th century, breastfeeding and wet nursing declined um, precipitously, <clears throat> only to be revived um, with vigor in the 60s and 70s, and finally um, in the 90s, uh, and, and of course um, in, the, in the first couple decades of the 21st century. But as we enter the 21st century, century we, we, we can still see that uh, questions of race, citizenship, belonging, um, whether or not women uh, have the right to uh, assert the power over their own bodies, uh, what it means to breastfeed, and what are the racial implications are still with us. As of the, the, the date of this talk, uh, the statistics on breastfeeding um, are, are such that um, uh, African American women have the lowest rates of breastfeeding. Now some people would associate that with socioeconomic, and of course that is the case. But it is also a deeper kind of notion. Um, um, many um, people see breastfeeding as being, a, as being a kind of continuation of slavery, and this is not something that has to be done now. So these notions and, and, and kind of modern day arguments and where we, where we go with this are all embedded in, in the ways in which we imagine ourselves as uh, Americans and as members of a larger international community. Thanks so much.